Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor. Today, I'm very excited because we have Dr. Fabio Sage been here, and he is a cardio surgeon, and he has amazing information he'd like to share today about health and different aspects of health that he wants to emphasize on. He also has created a great product, and he's going to mention a little about that later. But first, we want to talk about health, and we want to talk about how, you know, where we're going in this, in this country and other parts of the world, and different ways we can incorporate in our life to actually help ourselves overall our, improve our wellness um, and mind, body, and just, you know, different things we could do so we could feel good and live a long, healthy, happy life. So Dr. Fabio, tell us a little about yourself and what you do. Thank you, Stacey. Thanks for having me on. I really look forward to having this conversation with you. So uh, I'm a heart surgeon, cardiac surgeon, uh, practicing here in Orange County. Um, I, I did all my training in New York. I, I went to NYU Medical School, and then I did kind of specialized training in Rochester, New York. Um, you know, my, my life is really all about um, managing the biggest um, medical crisis that we face today. Um, if, if you just Google what's the number one killer of Americans, um, number one is heart disease, and it's by a lot. Uh, cardiovascular disease accounts for more deaths than cancer. It accounts for more deaths than uh, any other chronic disease. Um, it, it's a really big deal. Yeah. And it's funny because like, I just turned 41. I actually just turned 41 yesterday. Happy and, birthday. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and the funny thing is, as we get older, and um, there's this funny paradox that happens. And, I, and I'm wondering if, you know, if your listeners have experienced the same thing. It's like you're, you know, 20 and you're invincible. You've got energy, you've got health and vitality, but you don't have any money and you're a student and you're poor and you're just kind of grinding it out in life. Yeah. And then you're 30 and you're 40 and you're like, oh, I'm starting, you know, I'm through school. I'm starting to make some money. I'm starting to raise a family. But, oh, now my back hurts. And now I'm like a little overweight and I have less energy than I had. It's like this horrible trick that happens in life. Yeah. And um, I've just noticed that um, most of us are, are missing some really key elements and key practices that I think if, if we implemented early in our 30s, 40s, and 50s, we could be really happy and healthy and vital and energized through those critical years. Right. You know, when I, when I see my patients, um, I, you know, if, I, if I have to operate on a, a 50-year-old, I will tell them if they're a little overweight or if they've got some bad habits like smoking, mm -hmm. I'll tell them, look, this is your year. If you can turn things around at this stage in your life, your 50s will be great. Your 60s will be great. Right. If you don't, if, if you can't find a way to turn it around now, yeah. you're not going to die. I'm not telling you you're going to die in your 50s and 60s, but those will not be great years for you. They will right. be fraught with chronic disease and doctor's appointments and, and your life will not be what it could be. So, you know, I think it's, it's, we're hearing a lot of these kinds of messages, but I don't know if we're hearing it enough from, from physicians or from physicians who are kind of subspecialized. Right. I, I find a, a lot, our, our health has declined in the United States. When you hear doctors come on the show and they talk about all various diseases, you know, you, you see that, you know, like we had mentioned earlier, I was saying that in the last five years, diabetes has skyrocketed. You know, I've had, you know, heart specialists that come on the show and that were frustrated because they said one of the things that, you know, made them start to look into holistic health and start to look into other areas was because they started to see the same patients come in over and over and over again and they weren't improving and and a lot had to do with the way they were taking care of their bodies and you know what they were doing on a daily basis you know a lot we have so much processed food in the united states we have so many people you know just wanting every on the go 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 everyone's on the rush 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 and nobody's taking time to give themselves a little love you know men yeah. 
physically, you know, it's just, you know, they're just like overdoing themselves. You know, we're not robots, we're humans. And I think that has to get through people's heads. You, you look at other parts of Europe, you know, the blue zones, and you see people living past a hundred. Why is that? You know, mm -hmm. you know, do you find when you look at your patients or you meet people in your, in the medical field, that are patients, do you see the, uh, 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 kind of like a, a, a concurrent uh, behavior that people are doing that's actually setting them up for something bad, you know, and, and, you know, and because we see so many people are becoming obese in the United States and, and things are just on a decline when it comes to health. You know, what do you see in your, you know, since you are in the healthcare industry? Thank you for that question. It's, um, there, there's so much we could unpack in that, you know, that that observation that you've made that many of us have made. Um, and here, here, I'm, I'm going to like share an insider secret that mm -hmm. that many people don't know. Um, medicine and science. Um, sometimes we think of medicine and science as as. Um, this thing that we understand really well, yeah. this thing that we like, we have understood so much about um, the human body or how disease works or how cancer works. And this is the kind of embarrassing truth. D we know a lot about chronic disease, heart disease, medicine, physiology. We know a lot about that. People who've come before us and the decades before us have unpacked a lot. But the more we learn about it, the more we figure out we don't know. If, if you can imagine, it's kind of yeah. like walking into a cave. Imagine you walk into this dark cave and you have a flashlight. Right. And everywhere you shine the flashlight, that's like a piece of knowledge that science has discovered. And it's like, oh, right. look at this. I, I shine a flashlight over here, and now I understand bacteria and antibiotics. And I shine my flashlight over here, and now I understand viruses. And I shine my flashlight over here, now I understand lung disease and heart disease. Right. But we're getting snapshots of this dark cavern. We don't have the lights on yet. When yeah. the lights are on, you can see how everything is interrelated, how smoking contributes to heart disease, vascular disease, obesity, diabetes, pancreatic dysfunction, adrenal dysfunction. Yeah. So when you, you know, the, the science, when people think of science, I want them to think of standing in a cave with a flashlight. Right. Science is the flashlight. It allows you to see specific things. Yeah. But we sometimes people think, well, we have the lights on and we can see everything. We do not. And here's yeah. the thing that makes it even more complicated. The more we use this flashlight to shine in this cave, the bigger the cave gets. Yeah. So we, under, wow, this cave is so much bigger than we thought it was. Yeah. So in this funny paradox, the more we learn, the more we realize we don't know. So yeah. I, that's kind of setting the stage. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so what do we do when we're faced with this really tough paradox? Well, you have to cling to the things that have kind of, been tried and tested and true over many generations. Right. That's pretty good. We should not discard that. Yeah. And then as we develop and learn new things, we have to apply rigorous standards to understand those new things yeah. and understand how they will affect us in the future. And that's really science's job. That's my job as right. a scientist surgeon is to, is to usher that in to the public. And it's, <clears throat> it's a big responsibility. Right. One of the reasons that, you know, I like to talk to people like you is because, you know, people trust you. You have a voice. And and so, um, you know, you can you can kind of usher in this these concepts and help people understand these concepts so that when they hear about a carnivore diet or mm -hmm. when they hear about veganism or when they hear about this wonderful probiotic that's going to save their life <clears throat> hopefully that can be packaged into a context that will kind of give them the tools to dig deeper right if that makes sense oh yeah it does make sense i think go ahead oh i was just going to say you know what one example of that that's kind of really popular right now is um the keto diet or the carnivore diet okay if you look at the results of someone who goes from a traditional Western diet to someone who adopts a keto or a carnivore diet. The results are incredible. 
no scientist would look at the outcome of that and say, boy, that's nothing. There's definitely something there. Right. But I'm very apprehensive because what you see happen in six to 12 months may not represent what happens in 10 to 12 years. Yeah. And that's the part that makes me nervous because right. I'm, I'm hearing people on social media saying cholesterol is baloney. None of it matters. You can have a very high cholesterol or all of these things that make me, I'm like, I can't believe I'm hearing this because we know with very good science, yeah. the effect of cholesterol over decades. Right. We, we know that we know that people, you know, in, in the seventies to do bypass surgery, you know, my uncle got a triple bypass or quadruple bypass. That means that the arteries are so plugged that you need open heart surgery to basically create a bridge over the blockage yeah. using veins in your leg. And, you know, when that happened, you know, in the seventies, people were getting this operation when they were 40, yes. when they were 30 mm -hmm. all the time, it was common. Yes. In fact, if you were 50, you were considered too old, not too old, but you were considered old for that operation in yeah. today's world. In today's world, that's very, very rare. Most of our patients are 70 and 80 years old, which means the therapies we implemented in the 60s, 70s, and 80s had a positive effect. If right. you look at the average age of the person needing heart surgery in the 70s and the average age of the person needing heart surgery in the 90s and 2000s, totally different. Yeah. Something worked. And I don't think we should throw that all away. It makes me nervous when we do that. Yeah, no, I agree totally. But some of these diets too, like the keto diets, I heard that you really shouldn't be on it more than six months. Like being on it for a long period of time could actually do damage to the body. And, you know, a, the long-term effects could be a little bit dangerous. Is that true? I, yes, I believe that's true. Now, the, the keto diet is really interesting because I, I think for the first time we understood how drastic diets affect real physiology. Like when I was growing up and in medical school, you know, over 10 years ago, um, the role of nutrition was nowhere near as important as it is today. Right. And he, here's, here's the way I understand it. We all know people mm -hmm. who are like rail thin, tons of energy, and they can eat whatever they want. They can eat donuts, yeah. they can eat pizza, they can eat burgers, and they don't seem to gain a pound. What, right. what, you know, those are real people. What is happening with those people? How can I get that? What is happening to those people? So what's actually happening is they have a metabolism that for some reason can handle that burden of calories easily. Right. And they do not, they do not store the excess calories. They either burn them or they excrete them. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were to ask yourself, why is that? Why does this person have that metabolic makeup, right? You have to, you have to think of your metabolism kind of like a computer program. Mm -hmm. You're running a program on your computer and your body is the actual computer. They're separate things. Okay. The program that you're running on your computer is your metabolism. And what we're learning is that you can change that program. And I, I would have never believed that, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. But what we're finding apparently with really drastic dietary changes like keto, like carnivore, you are imposing such a different set of macronutrients to your body that your body has to change its program. Right. It has to change the metabolic machinery. Mm -hmm. It has to change which genes are activated to handle the calories that they're receiving. Your body, right. imagine your body's used to seeing glucose, protein, yeah. fats, and now all of a sudden, your body is only seeing protein. What do we do? All we see is protein. I haven't seen a, a sugar molecule in like six months. All we see is protein. We have to change things. We have to create new machinery. We have to activate these enzymes. We have to express these new genes. And a consequence of that is we see these physical changes in people. They lose weight and, and other things. Yeah. Now, I, I think there's wisdom in, now, if you're the kind of person who feels like I need this metabolic shakeup, Right. That's where I'm at. I think there's wisdom in applying these kind of judiciously so that um, so that it doesn't, um, you know, develop into long term negative effects. Right. But I think you have to be very careful. And, and I will admit and I think doctors should admit that we don't know exactly what this will look like in 10 or 20 years. Right. It's possible. It's possible that people who did keto 
20 years later are having strokes and heart attacks. Right. I hope that's not, I hope that's not true, but yeah. that's possible. And we have to be honest with ourselves. Right. A lot of times I feel like a lot of these diets, you know, like diet in general, like, you know, when people are overweight, it's good to put them on a specific, you know, maybe calorie restricted diet or have them have certain foods or teach them how to eat healthy. But a lot of these diet, you see so many different diets. You go on the internet, there are, there are, there's a diet for everything, you know, yeah. but it's um, a lot of these fast, you know, these diets, like, you know, and you hear about Ozempic now too, a lot of these diets that you lose weight so fast, you know, how good could that really be on the body? You know, your body doesn't even have the the time to the elasticity to to actually the skin to pull itself together. You know, you're, you're you're just like you're overwhelming your body. And then you also have to learn how to eat healthy because once you go on those fad diets and once you stop, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people say they gained the weight back or they gained even more weight back, you know, and, and uh, so, how, you know, really, is it is a diet really good, you know, like, or it, maybe it's just eating healthy, maybe, it, you know, maybe like a Mediterranean diet where it's more yeah. healthier and nutritious and you're getting the, the proper nutrients rather than these crazy diets that you hear left and right. And this is how you're going to lose, you know, you know, 75 pounds and this and that and all this other, other stuff. And also as a heart doctor, how much stress are you putting on your heart when your body is changing so frequently like that? Those are some really excellent questions. So I'm going to, I'm going to try to unpack some of that. <laughs> um, so you, you, you have outlined an important principle in, in body physiology uh, which is easy come, easy go. If you do things that will result in drastic changes over a short period of time, it seems like you are more likely to bounce back. Whereas if you make changes to your life that result in sustainable incremental changes, you are less likely to go back to your old ways. Right. So there are a couple of things that people could do before they even consider uh, a crazy diet. Uh, number one is don't smoke. <laughs> Smoking is probably the single most harmful thing that people can do. And everyone thinks of smoking and lung cancer. Yes, smoking causes lung cancer. The best science of clinical data, statistical data, inference, common sense, and reason all applied together have yeah. overwhelmingly taught us that smoking causes lung cancer. Right. Specifically, non-small cell lung cancer. OK, mm -hmm. so but what people don't know is smoking is one of the worst things you can do for your cardiovascular system. The, the nicotine, the tar, the other aspects of smoking, they they do a number of different things that basically cause hardening of the arteries. Now, if, if I were to show you an artery, mm -hmm. it, you know, they're anywhere from, you know, the size of like a little hot dog to yeah. the size of like a noodle you know mm -hmm. they can be big they can be small but they all have the same properties if you cut an artery you'll see it has three layers the innermost layer then there's a middle layer and there's an outermost layer and they're elastic when your heart squeezes mm -hmm. the arteries actually dilate like a balloon like if i blow into a balloon the balloon augments when yes. your heart squeezes your arteries dilate okay mm -hmm. slightly when your heart relaxes the artery contracts a little bit when i'm doing open heart surgery the biggest artery in your body is called the aorta and it's huge. It's like right. a sausage and it comes right off of your heart. When your heart beats, you can physically see the aorta dilate. Wow. And when your heart relaxes, you can physically see the aorta contract a little bit. So that elasticity is really critical to the health of your body. That allows your body to tighten these blood vessels and dilate these blood vessels to increase blood flow to your stomach after you eat, to restrict blood flow to your stomach when you're running a marathon and increase blood flow to your extremities, like your arms, your legs, to yeah. increase blood flow to your brain. <clears throat> so this capacity to modulate your blood flow, depending on what you need, yeah. depends on the elasticity of those arteries. Right. If those arteries are not elastic, they yeah. are encumbered in their ability to do that and right. when you smoke you are destroying that capacity for right. your arteries to do that you are buying chronic disease in the future so number one don't smoke if you smoke quit and you'll and you'll heal the second thing weight bearing exercises are some of the most important things that you can do when you do weight bearing exercises squats weights 
just like the term says, weight bearing exercises. Yeah. You are forcing your body to engage in a metabolic process of building. Your body says, why is this person lifting all these weights? I got to build more muscle now to support these crazy activities yeah. that this person is doing. I got to build right. more muscles in the legs and the arms and the shoulders in the back. And as your body has to engage in these metabolic processes, it will increase your muscle mass. And as you increase your muscle mass, you are actually improving your overall metabolic health. Right. You are telling your body, I need to burn more calories to maintain this mass. Right. And it's kind of a backwards way of thinking, but that's one of the most important things you can do. I think the third thing is making sure that you're taking in reasonable, healthy foods and adding the things that you need. Like, what is the perfect diet? That's a conversation for another day. Yeah. If you just apply some common sense and you stick to food that looks like food, I hope yeah. people remember this, <laughs> eat food that looks like food. Right. A watermelon looks like a watermelon. An apple looks like an apple. A banana, even whole grains. Whole grains look like whole grains. Right. Meat looks like meat. Eggs look like eggs eat food that resembles whole food. And that will take advantage of the processes that your body has to metabolize, to break down. Right. And those processes seem to be critical to health. The right. bacteria in your gut, you need bacteria. Without bacteria, you would not be alive. Right. The bacteria mainly resides in your small and large intestine. And bacteria eat the food that your body cannot digest. Think about this. You eat an apple, right? Yes. And let's say you have half a cup's worth of apple juice in that apple. Right. If I take two people and I say, you're going to eat this apple, you're going to drink this half cup of apple juice. Right. The person who drinks the apple juice, if you look at their blood glucose 10 minutes later, it spikes hard. Mm -hmm. The person who ate the apple, they don't see that same spike. Now, why is that? Because when you eat an apple, you're eating fiber, you're eating all sorts of structural molecules, you are getting apple juice and fructose and glucose and those things, but your body has to handle that whole fruit. And guess what? There's part of that fruit that your body does not absorb into the blood. And guess who gets that? The mm. bacteria. The bacteria are fed by that fiber. Right. And they thrive and they make vitamins, they make B vitamins, they make things that you need to live healthily. So eat things that look like food. And then, you know, I, I created a product called Che. It's spelled T-C-H-E because I recognize that in my own life, I didn't have the capacity to just, it's difficult to, to coordinate your day, to coordinate your dinners with your kids yeah. and all that kind of stuff. So I, I felt like I wanted to add a couple of key elements. Right. So in my opinion, this is my opinion, some kind of key elements are collagen. I've looked at the studies on collagen and I'm convinced collagen is able to be absorbed into your blood and it's able to be distributed in important areas like your skin, your joints to help you rebuild those things. Mm -hmm. So collagen is important. And so the product that I created has a full clinical dose of collagen with every serving. Multivitamin. You don't know if you're going to get all your B vitamins, your, you know, vitamin C, A, E, all the fat soluble vitamins. I think a good multivitamin, doesn't matter which one, pick one. Yeah. Good multivitamin is important. Probiotics, I think are important because they replenish that population that live in your colon and your small intestine. And we lose that population when you take uh, the wrong kinds of foods. And yeah. then when you take antibiotics, you can lose some of that population. So it replenishes that population. Probiotics are literally dehydrated bacteria that you can kind of repopulate in your colon. And then, you know, if you drink caffeine, I, you know, part of what we wanted to do when we built this product was enable people to have kind of a more sustained energy. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in the busiest time of my life, I was drinking an energy drink in the morning and then I would do an operation. And then I'd come out and I'd drink a second energy drink mm -hmm. and I just felt this spike of energy and then it would fall. And I learned through a lot of research, the way your body metabolizes caffeine and other molecules kind of affects the cycles of energy that you have. So when yeah. we created Che, we, we actually, it's the only product that has two forms of plant-based caffeine. Instead of using a caffeine extract, okay. like you find in energy drinks, like you find in yeah. most products, 
we use guarana, which is an Amazonian plant. Mm -hmm. And that gives you kind of immediate energy. But then I coupled that with the second plant, which is yerba mate. Yerba mate is people, you could spend all day just talking about yerba mate. Yerba mate comes from the south of Brazil. Mm -hmm. And instead of creating a tea, we take the whole plant and we mill it and we mix it in with our product. Oh, wow. So, so the yerba mate, because it's the whole plant, it's more like eating the apple, so to speak. Yes. You have to metabolize all of the structural molecules in the yerba mate so that then, you know, you extract the energy over time. So you have fast release energy, slow release energy. And right. then we put everything that you need, collagen, probiotic, multivitamin, and all those things. And I'll tell you, um, you know, in my opinion, if, if I have to reach for one thing yeah. to add to these other bits of advice, that's the thing that's worked the best for me. Um, so, I mean, it, it's you asked a really good question. And, and it's like, I think if people are willing to make these lifestyle adjustments, smoking cessation, weight bearing exercises, eating foods that look like foods, yeah. and then, you know, adding to that a supplement that makes sense to them. Yeah. Um, I think we would begin to see some major changes. Right. No, I agree with you 100%. And you know, while you were speaking, I was always curious too, because like once you smoke a cigarette, your, your lungs are originally pink. The first time mm -hmm. you smoke one cigarette, your lungs turn brown and they, it discolorates right away, your entire lungs. So now with the big fad of, of medical marijuana and, mar and many, in many states, marijuana is now legalized. When people mm -hmm. are vaping and people are smoking marijuana, is, you know, is that having the same effect to our lungs as a regular cigarette? That's a really interesting question. So um, when we do open heart surgery, there is a, a membrane that covers your lungs and separates your lungs from the middle of your chest called the mediastinum. That's where your heart lives. Yeah. But when we do bypass surgery, I have to access that space where the left lung lives because I have to harvest an artery okay. to do one of the bypasses. And so I look at the lung and I actually have to feel it and put my hand on it and move it out of the way to do this dissection. And you can tell who smokes and who doesn't because really? people who've smoked for a long time, they will get these black spots on their lung. And oh, when you wow. feel the lung, it feels stiff. Like all of the architecture of the, of the lung has been hardened and scarred. Whereas right. people who never smoke have very pink, very compliant lungs. It's very interesting. You can tell. Yeah. And so we know that when you take a puff of a cigarette, the nicotine will paralyze these very important cells in your airway. When, whenever you breathe, yeah. air goes into your mouth or your nose. It goes through your trachea, which is your windpipe, that goes yeah. down to the middle of your chest and it separates into two bronchus. The bronchi, left and right, will then break into multiple little bronchi. And mm -hmm. if you go all the way out to the lung, there are these tiny little airways. And if you looked at those under a microscope, you would see what looks like a little cube with little fingers on it. Those fingers are called cilia and their job is to sweep debris, oh, toxin, okay. yes. from the deep part of your lung forward so that you can cough it up. That's why, that's where a smoker's cough comes from. Okay. When you smoke, the nicotine paralyzes those little, those little cilia, so they freeze. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The nicotine does that. And then, so all that debris hangs out and you're not able to bring it forward. So if you're smoking cigarettes all day, man, your lungs get trashed. Because, yeah. you know, imagine those cilia are kind of like sweeping the doorway, right? If, if yeah. you live in a dusty place and you sweep every single day, that's like your lungs. Now imagine I get rid of your broom and you don't sweep for 10 years. Wow. You're going to be yeah. living in a dust pile. That's exactly what happens. So to answer your question, I don't know if other inhaled, you know, substances have a similar effect, but I'll yeah. tell you, I wouldn't chance it. Why, why, why chance it? You know what yeah, I mean? Exactly. Exactly. It's really interesting, you know, and you know, another issue is, is there's so much processed food in our society, you know, everybody, like we had mentioned earlier on the go, and you made a great point. If it doesn't look like food, then stay away from it, basically, you know, but it's like, you know, when you have, when you have food that comes into the body and the body doesn't recognize it as food, because it's processed, doesn't it usually leach on to different parts of the of the body because it's having a hard time breaking it down? So if it's having a hard time breaking it down and it leaches on to different organs and it's not processing the way it should, 
it's slowing down your body too, because it's taking longer for it to go through the process of, of breaking it down and getting the food at the, 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 uh, it's, it's absorbing the nutrients and getting the actual, you know, food out of your system. So if it leaches on to certain parts of the organs and it slows your body down, isn't that when you start to notice different symptoms and you might feel sluggish, you might feel, you know, some chronic fatigue, and then other issues can come apart by consistently eating processed foods. You know, um, yeah, I think there is some um, there are some things we don't understand about dietary science that we're now beginning to understand. You know, uh, one of the terms that's used commonly is processed. Mm -hmm. And um, if you look at like the FDA's definition of what processed means, uh, any time you manipulate a whole food, you're processing it. So, but I, I think we all recognized hyper-processed foods from whole foods, even if the yeah. definition is muddy, we're mm -hmm. like, okay, a Twinkie <laughs> at some point was flour and sugar cane and cream. Yeah. And now it's this <laughs> thing that will survive a nuclear Holocaust, right? We don't like, where does that come from? Like, we yeah. know that's not the same thing as eating sugar cane and drinking cream, right? Okay, so th right. there's a difference, right? What is the difference exactly? How does it affect us? I don't know. And I don't know if anyone actually knows. I know that when you eat anything, there's a very specific sequence of events that happens. Your stomach, which is basically full of acid, will take whatever you ate, will mush it up into like sludge. And then that sludge goes down into your small intestine. And your small intestine is like a sponge, yeah. But it has very specific little doors. It has a door that says sugar on it. Mm -hmm. And that door only accepts sugar. And it works through a very specific ch channel that has to do with sodium and chloride and other keys that will open that door. So that door yeah. says, give me all the sugar. There's another door that says, I only take proteins. Mm -hmm. And proteins are chopped up into little Legos called amino acids. Yeah. And the other door says, I only accept these amino acids. And another door says, well, I only accept fats. Yeah. And fats have a very specific molecular shape. Now, is it possible that when you eat a Twinkie or a hyper processed food that your body is now seeing these foreign things like what's glyphosate? What's, you know, maltodextrin? What are these right. other things yeah. that I'm not used to seeing? Do they sneak into the doorway and find their way into your spleen or to your brain? I don't know. And, and to find that answer, there's a way to do it. You have to do like radio labeling and you have to trace the molecule and see where right. it ends up pretty sophisticated stuff but i think we all recognize that eating twinkies or mm -hmm. the equivalent we don't feel good yeah something wrong happens and if yeah. you just apply common sense and you're like well look this is the way the human body was built it was built to be able to handle fiber glucose protein fats and so yeah. i'm going to give it those things in in the most common sense way possible. And I think when you couple that with weight bearing exercises and, and just these common sense shifts, you begin to generate some momentum. Now, <clears throat> there may be people who, who hear this and say, you know, all processed foods are bad. And I, I guess I don't necessarily argue with that, but I think you have to be careful with your definition of what process means, whoever's right. hearing this to be like, you know, um, there, are all, there are many arguments that are made in the world of social media that when I hear them, at least they don't make any sense. Now I might right. be missing something, but yeah. when I hear them, when I hear someone talk about <clears throat> how, you know, I don't want to alienate anybody, but you know, there are some dietary trends that when I hear people yeah. criticize or when I hear them advocate for, I'm like, well, I, that doesn't make any sense to me. If you could yeah. explain it to me, I would accept it. But um, I do think we've all, I believe, I have faith in the common sense of people. Yeah, I have faith in people's ability to say, you know what? Having a steak and a potato and asparagus, that's good. Mm -hmm. And having, you know, a bag of Cheetos <laughs> and, you know, a Twinkie, less good, not good. You know, especially when it comes to kids. Right. I, I believe that those changes by themselves would start to start to yield real results for people. Right.
No, I agree. I agree 100%. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and you want to emphasize on some important factors, what would you like the listeners to understand from our conversation today? Oh, man. So, you know, I I think that, you know, those four principles, which are, you know, don't smoke, uh, do weight bearing exercises, no matter how old you are, no matter how old you are, you should start doing weight bearing exercises. Eat food that looks like food <laughs> and, um, you know, add common sense supplements. Now, I, I would love for people to check out my brand and see if it works for them and what they like. Yeah. But the, the main message is I want people to understand that um, decisions you make in your 30s and 40s will dramatically impact how you experience your 40s, 50s and 60s. And yeah. those years are coming way faster than you think. So for you 30 year olds and you 40 year olds, you think about that today. You know, if you're if you're a busy mom and you're 33 and you're wrangling these toddlers, if you can find time to play pickleball, to jump in the water and surf, to whatever it is, how it's very hard. I get it. You know, I watched my wife in the thick of it with our little boys. But when she would make time to do those things, her whole life was elevated. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that's so important. And that kind of the last piece of advice, um, which is really non-medical, but I think it's so important for people to have some semblance of spirituality in their life, yeah. whatever that looks like to you, um, to connect with something. You know, if you were to define spirituality for me, it would be connecting with something that's greater than you, yeah. that's above you in some way, yeah. and allowing yourself to kind of recognize that thing. It does a number of things psychologically. It it makes you take yourself less seriously. Yeah. It it forces you to recognize that you are not the ultimate great power. And I right. think that's a good thing. I, I know there are people who argue that's a bad thing, but in, in my opinion, making your, <clears throat> you know, thinking a way that makes you more humble, more open, more receptive, yeah. mm-hmm. I think is, is a wonderful thing actually. No, I, I agree with you. I think there's too many people that that are so much into always wanting to be right and, and they're into power and, and trying to make their themselves like look like this image, you know, and mm-hmm. you know, and for what purpose, you know, when you when you can have gratitude in your life and you can be humble and you could really not so much look at and worry about what other people think about you, but focus on others and really focus on helping others. You know, life turns around. You start to see things in a, in a different way. When your eyes are always focused on what can I do for you? And that's your mentality. You, you on a spiritual level, it takes you to a totally different world. You know, you start to really look at people and you, you know, you have empathy for people and like, what can I do to make your life better? And then, you know, and, and you have gratitude for the life you have, not think about, Oh, I I wish I had this. Why don't I have this? Or why, why does he have that? And I don't have that. But then think about what you do have and how lucky you are for the things around you. You start to really look at life differently and, and you start to appreciate life, just appreciate the air that you go out and breathe. Hopefully you don't live in a toxic area where the air quality isn't that great. But if you do live in a good air quality, you know, at least you can go out and breathe the fresh air and you can have a cup of coffee and you can look at the trees and, and you know, look at life in, in, in a more positive way because I think positivity is what gets people to a whole different, you know, aspect of life. And that's what really brings happiness and joy is being positive, being, being insightful, being humble, being grateful, you know, and and those are great things to have. And I'm totally thankful for that. You came on the show today and shared your time with us. And uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. You really gave some great information and I hope maybe we can have you on the show in the future. And, you know, and we could talk some more. This has been an awesome experience. And before we Thank go, you. just let everybody know, what can, where can people find you? Yeah, so I've uh, reluctantly joined the world of social media. So um, <clears throat> you can find me at Fab Sagebin MD, uh, either on TikTok or on Instagram. So Fab Sagebin MD. My, my friends call me Fab ever since I was a kid. Like, you know, my, you know, my buddies would all call me Fab instead of Fabio. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can uh, check us out uh, if you want to try Che. Um, you know, um, reach out to us, DM us. Um, you can get a one week trial for twelve bucks with free shipping. Um, and then we have deals for people who subscribe. And that, um, if you just go to Instagram and and type in Che T C H E, uh, drink Che. 
And then you can go to drinkche.com. So drink, D-R-I-N-K-C-H-E.com and check us out there. Awesome. That's amazing. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I, I loved everything that you had to share. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Nice talking with you, Stacey. It's nice talking to you too. You have a great day. You too.